Okay, so I think I might I might get started. Uh, and uh, thanks for all the the messages from. I see some interesting weather reports. I think I, I'd like to be in Croatia from from what I see in the chat. Uh, so on behalf of the Eden Network of Academics and Professionals, or NAP as we call ourselves, you're very welcome to today's webinar about asynchronous approaches to teaching and learning. Um, so. We have a set of wonderful speakers lined up for you today. Uh, I'll introduce them in more detail in a few moments, but you can see them there on screen. We have Sarah Vatlonis Vatulak, sorry, I've, I've butchered your name, uh, joining us from Vermont, from Middlesbrough. Uh, we have Rima Altawil joining us from Canada, uh, but, but attached to Athabasca University, which is not, which is in the middle of Canada. Not, not exactly where you are. And then we have Katrina Niche coming to us from Trinity College Dublin, as you can see by her fancy background. Um, and my co-moderator today is, is my colleague from the NAP committee and, and our illustrious leader, Vlad Majescu. Um, so yes, nice wave there, Vlad, as well. So we have a really interesting topic today and uh, I'm really excited to hear from our participants um, on their approaches to asynchronous learning. We came up with this idea because really um, during the pivot online over the last few years, uh, pandemic essentially was sponsored by, by Zoom. Um, and a lot of really good asynchronous approaches, such as discussion boards, um, were probably not used in a way uh, that they could have been. And, you know, these approaches have been part of the DNA of online and distance education for a really long time. My, my, my estimate is about 40 or so years. So I thought, let's look at these approaches again. Um, asynchronous approaches tend to be more inclusive, uh, flexible, you know, for time engagement, flexible in terms of distance. There's a lot of really good benefits in terms of student learning. However, they can be quite challenging to do well. So that, that's one of the things we'll be thinking about. Um, getting good discussion going on discussion boards can be very challenging in my experience. So the way in which we approach that is part of one of the things we'll talk about today. So delighted to have you here. I'm going to... Uh, hand over to Sarah in a moment and I'll just read her bio now that I have it in front of me. So Dr. Sarah Lonas Vatulik is Director of for Digital Pedagogy and Media in the Office of Digital Learning and Inquiry or DELINK, which I think is a fantastic acronym at Middlebury College in Vermont, where she gets to work with awesome colleagues to create digital learning opportunities and environments that support learner agency and equity. That's a, a fantastic bio statement there, Sarah. So over to you, Sarah. Wonderful, thank you. And I will start sharing my screen. All right. Hi, everyone. I'm, I'm so happy to be part of this conversation today. Um, and thanks very much for the invitation. Um, I am right now located in at Middlebury College in Vermont, which is about three and a half hours north of Boston, about two and a half hours south of Montreal. So we're kind of nicely situated to have um, the best of, of both worlds. Um, and I'm sorry that my, my colleague Jenny was going to be joining us to uh, go through this presentation. She wasn't able to join us in the end, but I'll do my best to take us through things. And I really appreciated the pandemic was sponsored by Zoom comment. I've, I've written that down <laughs> um, uh, as a quote um, to, to attribute, uh, of course, in the future to Orna. But, um, and it is challenging to do well. And, and I think those were a couple of the things that were driving uh, that drove our creation of, of the cookbook as a resource. So let me, um, in this presentation, I'm going to talk a little bit about the cookbook, what it is, what some of the values um, that, we, that we think about around good asynchronous learning are, how they're embedded in the cookbook, and then share a few um, example recipes from the cookbook. 
So the Asynchronous Cookbook is an openly licensed resource, which is both a, a website and a downloadable PDF for faculty and learning designers who are looking to expand their knowledge and practice of asynchronous activities, but maybe like to integrate some more asynchronous activities into their courses. Um, these are in the format of a cookbook. So um, each of the activities are, are um, rendered in the format of a recipe. And the recipes draw on online learning research and good practice. They are designed to provide concise and specific instructions and examples. Um, and the key ingredient in each of the recipes is really meaningful interaction. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about these points um, in a moment as we go through. But these recipes can be used no matter what modality um, a faculty member might be teaching in. They can be used um, for teaching if you're teaching a primarily in-person on-ground class. They can be used in blended or high flex modalities or, or fully online modalities. So just to give a little bit of background as, as to why we created this resource. And, and in order to do that, I, I need to tell, just quickly tell the story um, of a little bit of our um, institutional response to the pandemic and to give a little bit of that context because the cookbook was, was really born from that. Um, our, our institution um, at the moment of the pivot to remote teaching in the spring of 2020 did not mandate a particular modality that, that faculty had to, had to teach in, as, as some institutions, at least in the United States, um, did. Um, our so the institution didn't mandate a particular modality then, nor have they since. They've really left that, uh, that decision up to individual faculty, to the discretion of the faculty as to whether they would teach uh, asynchronously, live synchronously, or some blend, or, you know, some blend thereof. Our group, D-Link, um, though, did recommend asynchronous as the primary modality when we were talking to faculty about what um, good and equitable online or remote teaching and learning would look like um, for reasons of equity, I think, as, as Orna already highlighted, given the challenges of the transition to remote learning, which our students experienced as well. Challenges with um, time zones, students you know, going to all different time zones around the world, um, uh, internet access, uh, unstable living situations in some cases, living situations that weren't optimal for um, their studies. And so um, from the beginning, we recommended asynchronous as, as a primary modality. So coming up on to the second pandemic fall, now after, after faculty at our institution had had the opportunity to experience and perhaps become a little comfortable with some aspects of remote teaching and learning, uh, we had some faculty who were interested in um, expanding their repertoire of asynchronous activities, looking for more um, activities to expand. And we wanted to be able to provide to them examples and really illustrate those examples of what interactive asynchronous learning could look like. So we came up with the idea of a cookbook um, in order to be able to provide step-by-step -step instructions and also focus on a relatively narrow set of technology tools to help faculty combat decision fatigue. We were excited that some faculty were interested in expanding their use of asynchronous activities. Um, at the same time, we recognize that faculty were and are, all of us, um, burdened by um, the challenges of the pandemic. And so we wanted to be able to provide something that would be relatively easy to um, learn and implement in their classes. One other point that I would make um, about the cookbook itself is that it actually, thinking about the range of resources that our office created to support faculty during the pandemic, um, it complemented our camp design online, which was a, originally a two-week synchronous and then a fully asynchronous course for faculty that took them through really more of a high-level focus on online course design. Um, and without getting into the nitty gritty of activity design. So the asynchronous cookbook really focuses on that level uh, of activities. So that's a little bit of, of background as to what brought us to the cookbook. Um, I may be, be perhaps um, preaching a little bit to the choir here, um, but we recommended asynchronous learning for the reasons that, that Orna described, that we felt that it best addressed um, uh, flexibility and equity for students uh, in the in online remote 
um, also hybrid um, learning experiences, as well as on-ground courses. So this is a practice that we have continued to recommend to faculty here at the undergraduate college. Classes have resumed fully in person on ground. We continue to recommend that faculty use asynchronous activities in their courses um, as a way of um, for adding some flexibility to their course design. Um, building in asynchronous activities that students can become comfortable with, um, they know what to expect, I think can really provide um, uh, um, a sort of a cushion uh, and cause fewer interruptions to learning in case of a need to pivot. And so that's an argument that we have, have made with our faculty. Um, and asynchronous activities also address learner variability. We know that not all of our students um, thrive in live uh, discussion type settings. And so adding in asynchronous activities provides a way for students to meaningfully participate and show what they know in a, in a, in a manner that is um, most comfortable for them. Um, and, and really closely related are, are the questions of equity that we've already touched on, um, that asynchronous learning can help to address barriers to full and equitable participation in synchronous learning. We found that some faculty's um, approach to including students who um, might need to come into class um, remotely um, while other students were in person was to record a synchronous live session and then ask those, those students who couldn't attend the live session to watch the recording. Um, and we have tried to, to say that to, you know, to faculty that that um, does provide the students access to the content, but it doesn't provide them access to a meaningful learning experience. Um, and so can we build some asynchronous activities perhaps around that um, in order that students can actually engage in, in the learning process with their peers uh, as well. Asynchronous learning, um, we feel, can also provide um, some low bandwidth alternatives um, to students for whom internet access continues to be an issue. So these are two key components that we thought of as we were designing, uh, choosing and designing the activities that ended up as recipes in the cookbook. I think when, at least when, when many faculty at our institution heard, you know, the term asynchronous learning, they tended to think of it as one type of interaction in particular, interaction between students and content. If you have ever sat through um, a required training that asks you to watch a few videos, right, click a few buttons, and then take the quiz at the end, I think that's what many faculty had experienced, not having experienced any other type of asynchronous learning. So, <coughs> we have emphasized with faculty that asynchronous learning can be active, engaging, and completed in a community of peers and instructors. That interaction between students and interaction between students and instructors is also possible. Um, not necessarily best left to face-to-face -face or synchronous modalities, I think as many faculty just kind of um, feel as a, as a default starting point as that's been their experience. Um, and so the recipes in the asynchronous cookbook aren't, aren't just a sort of um, you know, second-rate alternative to face-to-face, -face, but interaction is really a key ingredient in all of the recipes, interaction between students, between students and instructors, and between students and content as well. Excuse me. So as our instructional design team came together to create the cookbook, I'll just um, give a couple of, 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 uh, of insights into things that we were thinking about. We ended up selecting Pressbooks as the platform for the cookbook. Pressbooks is an open source book content management system. And so it very nicely fit the genre of what we were trying to do with the cookbook. Um, we also appreciated that Pressbooks generates a PDF file for offline use. And so that we, in, in that sense, we were able to provide the contents of the cookbook in another modality um, in a low bandwidth um, way for folks who might need to access and, and, and interact with, the, with the, the cookbook offline. The cookbook is Creative Commons licensed. Uh, and so it is available for folks to use and adapt. And I'll, I'll talk more about that later. And I just want to sort of give a shout out um, to my instructional design team. Uh, it really was a team effort putting this together, identifying recipes, writing the recipes in the cookbook, uh, and sharing them out with faculty. <laughs> so um, thank you, um, Orna, very much for posting the link to the cookbook. We're going to dive now into taking a look at a couple of sample recipes 
before I do that, um, just to give a, a sort of big picture overview of what's in the cookbook, the cookbook currently includes 15 recipes. These are organized into a variety of categories that are represented in the screenshot on this slide, including discussion activities, mapping activities, games, simulations and labs, writing activities, presentations, and things that fit more broadly into the category of class climate um, activities. Um, the cookbook also includes a few introductory chapters that share some key concepts for designing asynchronous activities. We tried to keep these short, but we really wanted to share some of the thinking that I just described in terms of um, how we're thinking about asynchronous learning, being interactive. Um, and we also provide some scaffolding for group and teamwork in asynchronous settings, given that many of these activities do um, um, are designed for group, potential group work, students working with one another. We wanted to share some, some of our thoughts about how best to um, set that up in, in an asynchronous environment. So please feel free to, to look at the cookbook um, and, and look through it as I am also going to take a look at a couple of recipes um, together. So the first recipe that I wanted to share with you all is text-based annotation. I'll come back to the slide in a moment, but I'm actually going to click over to the cookbook. Um, so every recipe has the same structure. It starts off with an introduction. We wrote this assuming that faculty may not know what these particular activities were. So the introduction provides a really brief definition um, or introduction to the type of activity. And it also gives a little bit of information about um, pedagogical information about when and why you might want to use this activity in your class. The recipes um, uh, include uh, things to think about to prep ahead in the case of doing text annotation or social annotation um, with uh, on text. Um, you will want to select your readings ahead of time, make sure they're available in a digital format um, that is scanned in, with optical character recognition. Um, and then every recipe has a list of ingredients. Some of, these some of these ingredients are standard across the recipes. So this was an opportunity for us to say um, to faculty that every activity should have clearly articulated learning goals. Every activity should have clear instructions or prompts and expectations for students. And every activity should have uh, some kind of assessment or feedback strategy. So those ingredients are present uh, throughout all of the recipes. And then other ingredients are specific specific to the recipe itself. So in this case, digital readings um, and a social annotation tool, which will be a critical component of this activity. And then down to the step-by-step -step instructions, um, which mirror in, in many cases the ingredients. So step one is to identify your learning goal. Again, to make this a little bit easier for faculty, we have tried to present um, example um, learning goals that they could use and modify in their courses. Um, and so here um, we're saying, you know, there are a lot of, and here we're also signaling, there are lots of different reasons that you might use uh, a text-based annotation activity in your class. You might use it for interaction as a place for students to discuss the text um, in the margins of the text. You might use it as a way to help deepen students' understanding of the content by adding additional thoughts, multimedia, um, additional content to the reading. So um, identify your learning goal and then create a prompt or instructions for the activity. Um, again, we share a sample prompt that can be modified um, based on the learning goal. Next is to choose a social annotation tool. Um, here you'll notice that, that what we've actually done is, is in most cases try to narrow the possible suite of tools because we know that there are approximately 10 gajillion edtech tools available, um, which is a lot to navigate and a lot to choose from. We've tried to narrow the, the suite of tools to ones that, that, that our institution licenses, um, also because we are able to support those tools. Um, and so that's something that is a little bit specific to the institution in this, um, in this particular recipe. Um, but we give a little information about the two tools that, that we have available to faculty, Hypothesis and Perusal, um, and some information about um, more in links to, to more information about how to um, integrate those with our learning management, management system and to use them. The final um, element of this recipe is uh, instructions for giving feedback or assessing. Um, and so here again, we um, take the opportunity to point out a few things that faculty will want to think about when they're giving feedback on this type of activity. We point out that any graded assignment, for example, should closely tie back to your learning goals and the specific instructions that you've given. So um, those are a few pointers that, that we share in this section. 
Uh, finally, every recipe includes an example. In most cases, it's an example of um, uh, a faculty member at our institution who has, has actually integrated this activity into one of their classes. So this is an example from a history professor at our institution, just a short little um, paragraph about um, how she used perusal to meet a particular learning goal, and then finally some additional resources. And so that's the, the basic structure of a recipe. Um, in terms of the interaction type, how, you know, uh, where interaction is present in this recipe, um, I think that you could use uh, text-based annotation to have students talk to students, to have students and instructors um, interact with one another, and for students to interact with the content. So I think this could be used to meet all of the interaction types. In terms of flexibility, this recipe allows students to engage with content and each other over time. Uh, and in terms of equity, it provides a way for students who, again, don't necessarily perform well in live discussions to contribute thoughts and engage meaningfully with their peers. So that is um, our text-based annotation recipe. Um, I had one other example um, that I could um, quickly share. It is choose your own pathway simulations. So something a little different. Um, this is... Uh, choose your own pathway simulations can be useful certainly in uh, a variety of disciplines, particularly our colleagues in uh, the sciences uh, might find this a useful asynchronous activity. So again, it has an introduction that describes a little bit about some of the, um, the, the reasoning behind why you might want to use this um, in your course, the list of ingredients, including learning goals, uh, prompts, and assessment uh, strategies identifying your goals. This one offers a little bit, This, given that designing a simulation is a little more complex, this offers a little bit more scaffolding around designing a real world scenario, things to think about in terms of um, branching decision points as you uh, create your scenario, um, give some ideas for online tools, uh, and then gives an example um, of a scenario that has been constructed with different decision makings, the learning objectives, um, and that is an example that faculty can use to design their own uh, scenario. Um, in some of these places, um, you may notice that we don't dive into depth about, um, I would say, sort of the, the buttons to click with the technology to make this happen. And if faculty have additional questions about that, we encourage them to come talk with our office and we can sort of talk through the recipes and customize it for their class. So um, in the uh, interest of time, I will say um, in terms of what's next for the asynchronous cookbook, we are currently expanding the cookbook with new chapters uh, and new recipes. We've just added a few, a new chapter and a few new recipes, and we'll be adding more by the end of November. Um, and we are also, um, again, Pressbooks, um, it, this is openly licensed, um, and Pressbooks um, does allow you to import uh, books from other Pressbooks installations. So if you, any of you at your institution are running Pressbooks, we are very happy to provide um, an archived copy of, of the cookbook that you can install on your own Pressbooks installation and then customize to meet the needs of your institution to be a little more customized to your institution. So we would be excited to, to share and collaborate in that way. And um, I'd love if you'd like to reach out to me um, to make that happen. So I think that's the, the, the um, brief run through. Um, I appreciate your time. Uh, hopefully we have some time for some questions. Um, here's my email address if you'd like to be in touch. And I just wanted to give a little bit of a shout out to our, um, my uh, learning design team who can help to put this together. Thanks so much, Sarah. It was really great to hear the story of your cookbook. Um, and Pressbooks is a really great platform. Um, I think someone in the chat was asking about the PDF. Is it is it possible to download that from the Pressbooks platform? It is. Uh, it is a little bit, um, you know what, I'm going to share my screen again because I will. You're going to demo it now. I like it. I'll, sh I'll, show, I'll show you where it is because actually as I was looking through and prepping for this, I realized it was maybe a little hidden. And so I think we'll try to find a way to highlight that link on the front page. But for the moment, um, if you're at the cookbook, um, going to, um, I think it is on the how to navigate this book page, which is the top element in the table of contents. 
there's a link you can also uh, to download a PDF of the book. And I'm going to grab that link uh, and also put it into the um, uh, chat window as well so that you can, you can directly hopefully click on that and get a PDF. That's fantastic. Thanks, Sarah. And I, I think somebody, somebody uh, Maria is there is offering, is talking about a translation. What do you think about that? What, what language would that be to Maria? Yeah. So would you be up for that Portuguese? Absolutely. I, one of the, the wonderful things I think about, you know, um, openly licensed materials is, is that, um, you can take it and customize it to your context. And so whether that's, you know, a translation or whether it's switching out Middlebury specific tools for your institution specific tools, adding recipes, you know, any of that would be, would be wonderful. So essentially um, once you've got a hold of the book, um, you can pretty much make any changes. Um, we have an NCSA license. So um, we just ask you to share a like um, and to give credit back and that's it. Fantastic. Okay, thank you, Sarah. Uh, we might come back at the end with additional questions. Um, and we might move on now to our next speaker, uh, which is Rima Altoil, coming hailing from Toronto, Ontario. Rima is a Lebanese Canadian educator with a passion for using educational technology to create interactive and engaging experiences. She started her career in the field of education as a teacher in the Lebanon. Um, and she currently is working uh, as an instructor and a senior learning construct consultant and instructional designer and undertaking her, PhD, her EDD studies at Athabasca, where she's researching the influence of nonverbal cues on student interaction and engagement in asynchronous discussions. So very curious to hear more about that and welcome Rima. So I'm going to pass over to you now. Thank you so much for now. I'll just take a, a second to share my screen. I have so many things open as usual. And while I'm doing that, I will take the opportunity to thank you, Sarah, uh, for uh, this amazing presentation about the asynchronous cookbook, Orna put the, uh, the link. Uh, and I had the chance to look at it and I found it to be really very interesting. So thanks for making it come to life. I think I'm sharing my screen now, so let's see. Can everybody see it? That's fine. Yeah, perfect. Awesome. Thank you. So as Orna has just said, I'm doing my doctoral, uh, my doctorate studies in distance education at Athabasca University in Canada, Alberta, but I reside in Toronto and I was so happy to read in the chat all the different countries that everybody's joining us from uh, today. So that's very exciting and I'm looking forward to hearing your questions once I uh, finish my presentation. So keep them coming, please. Um, of course, today I'm going to talk about, as Orna said, electronic nonverbal cues, or what I refer to as ENVC, in the online course Asynchronous Discussions. So this is specific to the discussion boards or the discussion forums where people log into the course and they start interacting together and talking together through textual uh, communication inside the discussion forum. My interest in this topic stems from my background in communication and my experiences in online learning as a student before the popularity of or the Zoom boom or the popularity of video technologies during COVID. This is when, uh, as Sarah mentioned, and Orna as well, this is when asynchronous discussion forums were used as the main strategy for interaction and engagement in the online course activities. Uh, it really makes me curious to see how they have resided and how they have declined. Uh, not many people are using them right now, despite all the benefits that Sarah mentioned. Uh, so uh, based on the research that I did before, I'm going to talk a little bit today about uh, 
a study that I conducted around communication and the discussion forums, especially non-verbal communication and the discussion forums, to discover whether, first of all, they existed, and if they did, how they impacted or if they had the potential to impact the level of interaction and engagement in the discussion forums. But before we start, how about we engage in some uh, multimeter activity? So for this purpose, I would invite you to to either scan this QR code on your phones or on your computers, if you're at the computer, go to menti.com and you can enter this code. And I think I have the link right here, which I'm going to put in the chat for everybody. Yep, I got it. So if you click at this link in the chat box, you can access Menti Meter. Okay, so while we're talking about uh, nonverbal communication, and before I start, I want us to try to join Mentimeter, and I'm keeping an eye on the number of participants that we have here. Are we able to join? Yes. Good. Okay, so here we go. Um, take a few seconds to write as many words as you can that come to your mind when you think about nonverbal communication. And while you're doing so, I will clarify that in communication studies, the importance of nonverbal communication comes from the fact that it is a very old communication system, much older than languages themselves. It's so ingrained in human nature that it sometimes overshadows verbal messages, particularly when revealing messages related to personality, emotions, and attitude. And when I say personality, it means also personal characteristics, first impressions, and all of that. And in case of discrepancies, people usually, and I'm happy to see the body language very big in the center, because people usually believe nonverbal communication over the verbal communication. So let's say, for example, you ask a friend, how are you feeling today? And they go like, I'm fine very fun, I'm very happy today. You do not take that <laughs> as they are happy. And I'm sorry for my typo here, probably Mentimeter to take my last uh, uh, letter. So looking at these words that keep coming, I notice that many of us are focused on the facial expressions, body language, movements, but I see some written and discussion forums and writing style and applause and voice and all of these. So, but let's look at the bigger ones, gestures, body language, smile, and facial expression. So if we move to our next question, what happens when we take all these away, when we remove them from the communication process? So when we are communicating with people asynchronously through text in the discussion forums, we remove the facial expressions, we remove the body language, we removed all nonverbal communication that's expressed through voice. What remains? So in your opinion, do nonverbal cues exist in the asynchronous online course discussions when we removed all those nonverbal cues that I just mentioned, or at least you put as really, really big? While we're talking about this or thinking about this question, I would like to clarify that in this context or in communication studies, verbal communication, the word verbal, the term verbal means expressed through the use of words. Those words could be spoken or written. Therefore, when we talk about nonverbal, nonverbal in this sense becomes without the use of words beyond, or beyond the actual meaning of words. I'm happy to see that many people think that, yes, they exist in the asynchronous online discussions, which also takes me to the next question. And if you think it's yes, what do these cues look like? <laughs> Write the words or expressions that come to your mind. 
what are what like if you said facial expressions, body language, body movements, gestures, voice, and we're communicating only through words? Okay, emojis, excellent icons, tone, interesting. Mm -hmm. Looking at these words, especially emojis, emojis, of course, emoji and emojis, they can be the same. I noticed that many of them are related to face-to-face -face interaction, even online. Smiley faces and emojis. I wish to hear more. That's why I'll give us. So, When these are taken away, acknowledgements, capital letters, smiles. Mm -hmm. Okay, when most of these are related, like a lot of these are related to nonverbal communication through body language or surrogates of body language, which is emojis and icons and images. But I'm interested to see more about other categories that are related to time. Audio recording is going to express the verbal through the nonverbal through the voice. But if we take that away, time, using punctuation, certain choice of certain words, all of these are related to some nonverbal categories. So Looking at communication studies, as I said, I have some background in communication studies. So looking at communication studies, we noticed that other than body language and facial expressions and the, what we call paralinguistics, the tone or the attributes of the voice, there are other nonverbal categories. Uh, some of them are related to the touch, to the body movements, to the aesthetics like signs and symbols, to things we smell and to uh, chromatics and chronemics. Chromatics is the relationship or the messages sent or received or exchanged through the use of colors and chronemics through the use of time. Of course, some of these cannot be exchanged through the written uh, nonverbal communication, but some of them do get exchanged. And while I was thinking about all these categories in view of my knowledge in communication and my studies in communication studies, I asked myself these questions that I just asked you. So I pondered on this question when I was an online learner, learner and a discussion-based online course where interaction happens only through nonverbal, uh, through a discussion forums. And I wondered how come some instructors are able to create a community in these classes? How come they are able to provide the environment that's inviting everybody to interact, that's making me become more engaged in those classes? And it's not something they said, it's something they did. So what are the actions that spoke louder than words in an environment where communication was happening only through the written word. So I conducted a research to explore those actions or those nonverbal cues following the exploratory mixed method design. So my research included some qualitative questions in which people talked about what made them interact in those courses, how they felt that they, they felt the teacher's presence and their colleagues' presence, how they interacted with them. And based on that, I created a quantitative survey. In both uh, phases, I had instructors and uh, uh, learners participate. So I had both professors and students participate in this study, and they were all very experienced in discussion-based online learning courses because this happened before COVID. Uh, 
my aim was to explore, first of all, whether nonverbal cues existed based on the uh, categories that I talked to you about. Uh, these categories, I call them electronic nonverbal cues. I call them electronic nonverbal cues or ENVC, as you see here, just to differentiate them, to distinguish them from the common nonverbal cues that are exchanged during face-to-face -face interactions. So when I say E and VC, it means they are exchanged electronically only through text-based uh, online uh, communication. Not necessarily only asynchronous discussions, but I conducted my study in asynchronous discussions. The findings of my study suggested that there were at least four categories of nonverbal cues that are mostly present in the literature on nonverbal communication, which can infiltrate the textual communication in the discussion forums. And these categories have the potential to influence the online learning experience. A very simple mind map, these are not new, but a very simple mind map shows what these can be. So some of them are, as you mentioned, emojis, but I didn't use them as one category because they fell under a bigger category of visual cues. Actually, in the world of communication, facial expressions and body language, especially body movements, they also fall under the bigger category of visual, nonverbal cues, visual verbal cues, because we perceive them through our eyes. So, uh, chronemics, ESET, and the lack of communication. Talking about each one of them, I start with the 2D visuals because they are the easiest to talk about. These are perceived, as I said, visually. And almost most respondents to the questionnaires identified the 2D visuals as a form of ENVC, which included, of course, surrogates for body language in the form of pictographs, emojis, and emoticons, just like you, profile pictures and photographs of family and pets, illustrations in the form of graphics and diagrams, font style, as you mentioned a little bit, and the formatting, and the layout and the length of the post postings. Uh, what people said about these cues was, was very uh, surprising to me. For example, when we talk about the length of the posting, when we talk about interaction, why people interact and don't interact with uh, certain people. Some people said, for example, if the posting is too long, I tend not to read it, so I don't interact with that person, for example. But I'm going to talk about this a little bit after. Uh, another category was chronemics. Chronemics is very related to time. I'm sure many of us heard the expression time talks. According to scholars in the field of communication, chronemics is the strongest survivor of all nonverbal cues when the body language and paralinguistics and other nonverbal cues disappear. The very interesting part about chronemics is that it becomes very evident in textual communication, especially in the discussion forums. Why? Because the LMS most of the times allows for timestamps. And especially this generation that communicates a lot through text, they look at the timing. They become very uh, sensitive to when a message is sent and the time lag between a message and a response. So when other senses, it's, it's like losing other senses. When the other nonverbal cues disappear, like facial expressions and the smile and the tone of the voice, people become very sensitive to messages exchanged through the use of time. For example, they can tell you that I had a very good experience in a certain course because the instructor was responsive. When they use the word responsive, it means they were 
answering their questions quickly. Quickly is related to chronemics. So the use of time has influenced how they perceive the learning experience. I chose here from my study a uh, quote that a participant wrote. And you can see how unknowingly the person was talking about chronemics. For example, the person said, someone who participates regularly, regularly, this is the frequency, and does so in a timely, the time, timely manner, taking the time to proofread their posts, designing and uh, using all these things. I tend to respond to those people in the online asynchronous discussion. But look at the frequency again. People who have too much presence, right? Too much, it's like they dominate the discussion. Posting first, first, the first tone of the voice and what you mentioned are the people that I avoid interacting with. So we can see here the relationship between the chronemics and the level of interaction. Chronemics was also very related to the lack of communication, lack of communication or silence, and I will distinguish between the two in a second, was one that influenced that was usually related to negative learning experiences. Uh, the principle of lack of communication as being a communicative or having a communicative value or a message value is based on the principle of communication, which states that we cannot not communicate. So lack of communication is by itself a way of communication or a way of sending a message, or at least it can be perceived as a message and it can influence the learning experience. And here, if we read this quote from one of the respondents who wrote, if the teacher does not respond, so the teacher, lack of communication, or no one <laughs> responds to what I write, then I'm left in a cloud of ambivalence. If I'm ignored, I take it as a negative response. But when this occurs, I contribute only enough to get my mark. So lack of communication is directly connected with interaction. I really like this last quote that I added here from a respondent who wrote, it makes me very upset when an instructor does not log in to the course website for several days during the week. So this is connected to the chronemics and it's also connected to the lack of communication. Four to five days in a row, when it happens, I tend to become very disturbed. And the person was saying, I'm still disturbed by that until now. So lack of communication, or no communication is also perceived and interpreted and it, it influences the learning experience. Silence in that matter was distinguished in my study because they were saying, they were talking, respondents were talking about silence as not communicating or using it to express discontent, but also communicating, but leaving something untold. So it's not what people say, it's what they do not say that also has a communicative value in, this, in the mind of people who participate in discussion forums. Here, the last category I'm going to talk about was a little bit difficult to name because there was nothing that looked like it in the studies of communication. It resembled a little bit the tone of the voice or the style of writing. As I was reading right now, I smiled when I was reading your responses because, yes, many people identified it. Uh, but it had an additional component related to it. And that was a little bit about the effort that people made while communicating online. The easiest way to talk about it is perhaps by giving you a very simple example. I'm going to show you this example right now. So in my study, I gave the participants two layouts of a discussion posting. And I asked them to look at these two layouts and answer a couple of questions. 
One of the questions or the last question was, which layout are you most likely to respond to? So if you put in the chat, if you were participating in this, which layout would you, just put in the chat, layout A or layout B, which layout are you most likely to respond to? Or you can put no difference. Okay, Linda has no difference, but I can see mostly Bs and I cannot see any As, which is very interesting actually, because even the respondents in my study, they had very similar respondent uh, responses. So as you can see, some said there is no difference. Mostly, 79% of instructors, uh, of professors, 75%, whereas almost 80% of learners said that they would inter interact with <laughs> B, with the writer of B, they out B, but no one, as I can look at the chat right now, no one said that they would interact with layout A. I didn't know what to call it. It's not only formatting. It's not only... Uh, it's not only the style of writing, it's also the effort. So I called it ESET for the electronic style, effort, and tone that appear together as one set. And although no one talked about the formatting of the text, in this question, everybody almost intuitively was inclined to respond to the writer of layout B. I asked people to clarify, and I wish I had, <laughs> I, I wish I had uh, the chance to ask you, and probably after you can uh, you can uh, express your comments. Why, why did you choose to respond to the writer of layout B? Um, I asked them if they had. I asked the respondents to justify the answers if they had any justification uh, or to clarify their choice. I didn't, it wasn't, uh, they didn't have to, but some chose to. What they did not know was that what's written in layout A is exactly the same thing that's written in layout B, unless they really took time to read it, except for the hello everyone and at the end uh, regards or something like this. So this is exactly the same text, right? So these were the responses. They described layout B as being more reader-friendly, organized, easier to navigate, and visually pleasing. But what was really interesting for me is that they described the personality of the writer. Although they don't know who that writer is, they've never met the writer. It's like the first impression, right? They described that person as being the writer of layout B, as being friendly, warm, inviting, open, inclusive, engaging, pleasant, fun, thoughtful of the time of others, chronemics again, and not taking themselves too seriously. Imagine they don't know. It's just in a survey. Whereas they described a uh, writer of layout B as someone who took themselves very seriously and did not put enough effort into making their thought or opinion meaningful to their peers. So how is interaction how is interaction impacted? It's impacted through several, several factors, including the layout. Uh, of course, my study, this study showed that uh, at least four categories of electronic nonverbal cues, chronemics, ESET, absence or lack of communication, and uh, uh, visuals, of course, everybody identified visuals, have the influence to uh, have the potential to influence the learning experience, particularly engagement, motivation, social presence, teaching presence, and interaction. So moving forward with my studies, I am researching currently the aspects of ENVC that contribute towards interaction and engagement that lead to deeper learning in the asynchronous discussion-based online environment. So moving forward, I want to see how those ENVC can contribute to interaction and to engagement, and whether this interaction and engagement can also lead to deeper learning, because when people are engaged, they tend to read more and learn more. 
So I will keep you <laughs> updated of how this is going to evolve and looking forward to your questions or comments. Thank you for listening and for allowing me to share a little bit about my research with you. Thanks, Rima. Vlad, I think there's a, a question there. Do you want to put it to Rima? Yeah, sure. Thank you, Rima. Very nice presentation. We have uh, one question uh, from YouTube, actually, because we also have uh, uh, people on, on YouTube. So uh, the question is, if your research is already published, but I think um, uh, Orna already put an article about it, but maybe you can uh, talk more about, uh, about this, Rima. Absolutely. Thank you so much. It is published actually in the February uh, uh, in the February issue of Erodal, February 2019. February 2019, it's published under uh, the title of ENVC. Thank you so much, Orna. ENVC in text-based online learning environments. Thank you, Rima. Um, I think maybe we will have time for more questions at the end of this session. I encourage you to ask uh, to put your question in the q a section or in the chat and uh, or on youtube and we will uh, get the answers from participants orna please thanks lads and and thanks very much rima it was really interesting um the the thing with the message a and message b it just gets me every time um so very pleased to introduce dr katrina niche now newly doctored so i have to use it i definitely have to use the doctor uh, so uh, katrina is working in trinity college as an academic developer in her previous role she worked in the irish national forums development of all those who teach priority katrina has worked on a number of online teaching and technology enhanced projects including the open teach project where we work together um, and the assessment for learning maths project as well um, so welcome, Katrina, and over to you. Thank you very much, Orna. Um, I'm now, I hope, sharing my screen with everyone. Yeah, it's perfect. Great, super, thanks. And thanks very much, Orna, both for the introduction and for the invitation and to those in Eden for the invitation to speak this afternoon. Um, as Orna has said, I'm currently working in Trinity College Dublin as an academic developer, but in a previous life, I worked with Orna in DCU on the Open Teach project. Um, so Orna asked me to come along today to just speak a little about the asynchronous activities that we did as part of that Open Teach course. So um, just to give you a bit of bit of background on the Open Teach project. It began in 2019 and ended in 2020, and it was pre-COVID, but as it happened, it was very timely. We knew as online educators, we already knew that teaching online was different. Um, however, I, I think for the vast majority of educators, they've now found out that too in the last 18 months. And um, essentially what we did is we developed a short course that was informed both by a literature review and a needs analysis. And um, the literature review was called Teaching Online is Different. Um, and it um, enabled us to develop the course, which we rolled out then in March, 2020. Um, so there were uh, uh, initially 80 people who registered for the course and, we, uh, and then as it was just at the beginning of the pandemic, we had 400 signed up. So um, why did we do asynchronous activities? So the short course was 10 hours, 10 to 12 hours in duration, and we had two hours of synchronous teaching, and the remainder was asynchronous. And the reasons we did the, the asynchronous and goes back to what both Sarah, what Sarah and Orna were talking about earlier is to meet the needs of the learners, the busy educators who wanted asynchronous activities. But also because it's recognized, as Sarah outlined, as, as an effective teaching practice. And again, as we saw with Sarah, it has to include interactivity. So the literature that we examined, a lot of it looked at this inter interactivity in terms of, and we've heard these terms already today, the social and teaching presence, presences. And many of the studies that we looked at um, 
were examined online teaching through the lens of the community of inquiry. And really what we, you know, what we knew ourselves, but also what we found from the literature was that this idea of being present for the students is very important to encourage student engagement. So what did what did the open teach actual course look like? So I've, I've just taken a screenshot here from from the from what it looks like in DCU, uh, the, the the virtual learning environment in DCU, which is called Loop. Now this is an archived version of the course because this was back in March 2020, um, but I, I'll just show you a little bit from it. Um, so to develop the course. OK, we did the normal thing. We, we, you know, we decided what the learning outcomes. We used the ABC curriculum design uh, learning design method, which I've been linked there uh, at the end of the slides to to help us select the activities that we wanted to do for, you know, to match so that the students would achieve the learning outcomes. And we decided at that stage as well to use scenario based learning. So so we picked three topics and I, I'm sure you probably can't read them there on the slides. But um, the three main areas were the social presence, the online class and collaborative activities and supporting students and using discussion forums. So, you know, very similar to what, what, what um, Sarah was talking about earlier and the discussion forums that Rima was speaking about. So they were our three things. We came up with three dilemmas, three different educators, the dilemmas they had. And we fleshed them out in terms of having asynchronous activities for the students to do. So if we just look there, I'm going to give you the, 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 oh yeah, and the final thing there, sorry, I meant to mention was that in order to make this um, user experience, this an engaging course, we used a design thinking methodology around that. And we, we found that very effective. And um, we had a publication on that, which is again linked to in the end of the slides. But in terms of looking at what exactly we did, if we take that first unit there, the introduction, and we look here, these were the activities the students had to do in, in that, that first unit. And as you can see here, the one outlined in red, that was the synchronous activity. Um, so, so there were two, two of them, but, but that's it. The remainder of the activities were asynchronous. And uh, it was a very interesting listening to Rima there about the discussion forums and the verbal and nonverbal cues and what they were. We used a lot of discussion forums and we found them quite effective in this. So I, I, I'll just show you a couple of examples. For example, this icebreaker activity. We asked them, this is the, you know, uh, people here I'm sure are familiar with icebreaker activities, but we asked them to pick a word or a picture that, you know, represented how they felt about being on the course at the moment. So I just selected one here was uh, 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 someone who picked Amethyst, um, which is a gemstone, which represents important facets of their life and intuition, wisdom and resilience. So this was their discussion post. And now you, you must remember, we had about 200 students on the course at this stage and we wanted everyone to get a response. So we encouraged other, you know, other participants to respond to each other. And in this particular case, someone came up with, with this response that they loved the image because this reminds them of their holidays in Nackle Island. And, you know, also for this person responding, they want to develop some wisdom during the course. So we ensured that everybody had a response in their icebreaker activity or in their introduction, either from one of the facilitators ourselves or from another student. And because there were so many students, we broke them into groups and we as facilitators, um, uh, um, you know, took a few of them each. And, you know, I hasten to add here, which I meant to add earlier there, that this was a team effort. And there were um, five or six of us working on the course. And, and the names are all mentioned there earlier on on, on the um, literature review. But we all worked together to, to provide this. So it's, it's not easy to facilitate these uh, discussion forums, as you know. Um, and then how did we keep that going um, during, you know, during the course and, and what did we do? So we encouraged different forms of interaction. And again, interesting from Rima's point of view, whether, you know, what, what, what is considered uh, verbal and nonverbal, but we encouraged them to have text or audio. And, and there's me in my, my former role um, giving a, a video as part of the introduction in, in a way to encourage other people to do so. 
And when we when a discussion forum was coming to the close at the end of, of that, we kind of brought all the responses together, summarize them in some format. And one example here is, is some of the words people up to put up to describe themselves. We summarize them all together in this word, um, word cloud for people just to, to take home with them at the end of the discussion forum. We also use Twitter and um, we tweeted out messages and maybe tweeted out resources. But I think the main focus of, of the Twitter in this course was, was keeping that social presence going during the course and making sure that, you know, people could connect with each other all the time. Um, then another thing we did, which uh, we we had a few questionnaires uh, during the uh, as part of the, an activity. And again, these are could be completed whenever the students wanted. But this particular one was to ask them what they'd like to be covered in, in the next um, synchronous session or in the synchronous session. And uh, finally, then another uh, activity we did, which was group projects. So the groups worked um, in synchronous mode together, but they recorded their activity both as video and also as um, a document. And then we responded, the interaction from the, from the facilitators on this was uh, in an asynchronous manner, we responded to those, to those projects and had communication with them in the project uh, discussion forums asynchronously. Um, so again, if I you know, remind you that we had a number of units in, in this uh, course, um, the first unit was on social presence. So the way we presented that, we wanted things to be interactive and engaging for the students so that, you know, they felt they were, you know, partaking in activities all the time. So um, the first dilemma we had was Emer's dilemma, and it was around social presence. And uh, we created animations, which are available there in YouTube. And I have the link to those in on my slides as well. But the animations were super. The students or participants really liked them. Um, and, and the idea here was that they were presented with a dilemma. In this case, Emer had a dilemma, like many people will discuss about how, and it's interesting as well, how the discussion boards have fallen off because of, of COVID, because of the lack of engagement. Um, and we asked, you know, this we presented the Emer dilemma in an animation form, and then we asked our participants to come back with ideas on how they could help Emer solve her dilemma. And this they got, get these responses back in a discussion forum. But at the end of this discussion forum, we, we created a mind map for them. Linking together, as you can see, Emer, what would you do for Emer? Linking together the different types of activities that they came up with and um, pulling in all the threads from the discussion forum into one big mind map that they could take home with them. And in fact, then that was in the first unit. For the second unit, where we were looking at Michal's dilemma, we actually created a kind of a template mind map for them to start with Michal in the centre and ask them after they posted their discussion in the discussion forum to add maybe a word in, in into the or a picture or whatever into the um, mind map as well. And again, this kept them, gave them a, a resource at the end and a resource they created themselves to take away. So I suppose the question then is, you know, how did this go? Did people engage? Um, as you can see here, we gave a badge uh, to people. So we had 400 who initially signed, signed up, probably 200 who turned up a lot, probably due to the busyness around the beginning of COVID didn't manage, but we 200. And then we had 140, I think it was, who actually received the badge and completed the course fully, which was we were very pleased with. We did a post survey, um, a participant post survey, and um, I'm not sure if you can see these things, but we asked them, the blue there is positives, yes. We asked them if they thought the Open Teach course had an impact on their understanding of teaching online, and the vast majority of them said yes, it had. And then we also asked them 
would they apply this knowledge? And again, 97% of them said they would. So, so there are very positive results from the, from the participants. And then, as I said, one important thing for us was, a, you know, the sense of community um, or presence that we wanted to develop. And, you know, 70% of them felt that they partook in the Open Teach community for the course, which was really, really very good considering at the time what we were all in, it was late March 2020, we were all not just from a work-based scenario, but in a personal scenario, we were all obviously very concerned about what was going on. So to, to, to generate that community then was, was absolutely great. And some of the comments then that we got back from our participants, um, so you know, was I'd no knowledge of online teaching beforehand, and now I could teach online to my learners. And this is somebody who attended, an, let's say, an 80% asynchronous course. Uh, and then being facilitated to work through the course in a way that made it seem so easy um, is also a very positive com comment about how it went. Um, so overall, you know, it, it, it was a very successful course and it was run again uh, later, but it was it was the interactivity um, around the asynchronous activities that you know seem to keep everyone engaged all the time. So this journey, I'm looking back on the Open Teach because uh, um, project because as I said, it ran again last September, and, and and that was my last involvement with it. But it has actually made me reflect back. Um, and looking to, to my own practice here now in uh, Trinity, where we're looking at, we're, I'm involved in a project called Digital by Design. And the purpose of this is to help build digital capacity for education in, in Trinity and basically to, you know, build from the pandemic experience that staff have had and to mainstream those practices that worked. And this project has a number of phases. And the first phase we're looking at at the moment, uh, we're still almost come to completion is the research phase. We're looking back at what happened, asking our uh, academics in Trinity what worked for them and what didn't work for them. Also looking at the literature out there and at other universities and what worked and what didn't and what everybody would like to bring forward into the teaching going, going forward. And uh, we were, were very much into a discipline specific focus around the three faculties in, in Trinity. And with the view to developing professional development for our staff. But what we've done in our research phase is very interesting in terms of asynchronous. When we look at asynchronous activities and we ask them what, um, you know, what mix of asynchronous and synchronous did they do in their teaching, we found, uh, as people have suggested, that asynchronous was less likely to have occurred than synchronous. And that's at a module level for both staff and students um, said this. And that, however, in STEM, uh, it was more likely, more common in STEM to have synchronous. And everyone referred to, it, sorry, to have asynchronous. And everyone referred to uh, pre-recorded lectures and discussion forums. And, um, you know, just to give an example here, there was an awful lot of um, positivity towards the pre-recorded lectures from the students' perspective because of the pause and rewind and from um, lecturers' perspective in terms of a flipped classroom. And looking at the discussion forums, what we found about them that when we asked them about the teaching activities they had completed, and these were a mixture of synchronous and asynchronous activities, we found that they rated discussion forums as the least effective. And, and that's exactly what Sarah has been saying too, and Orna from, from the beginning. And they were the least effective, you know, rated by both staff and students. And um, what they said, for example, they tried to use them, but the student didn't engage. And from the student perspective, people said they said they were scared to post questions. And I, an example of one that worked was where some where a professor gave a mark for each posting to the discussion. And then this generated um, uh, this was the best discussion board the student experienced because people contributed uh, more and more as the weeks went on and became a little bit of a hub for discussing course material. So it did work in some instances. And, and this is what we're trying to do is bring what worked forward and these kind of things forward. Um, and, and so we asked also in the survey, 
what would people like? And, and yes, people going forward, the staff and students both want a mix of sync and asynchronous activities for the future. But people are concerned of what is the proper appropriate blend. And, and, you know, that's something I suppose you have to figure out for your course. And as I say, for the Open Teach, we had an 80-20 and an 80 async, and it really worked very well. Um, but we want to take forward that it's not just pre-recorded lectures and poorly performing discussion boards that, that form part of our asynchronous activities. There's a lot more to it. So moving back to the digital by design project, our intention is to develop activities, our uh, professional development for our staff and students that supports them in both the synchronous and asynchronous teaching approaches. And of course, I love Sarah's cookbook there, which I had had a look at um, before today, and really think that will be a great resource for us to link out to and um, provide. Um, so that's me done. Gaurav Mahagwif, thank you very much for listening. If there's any questions. Thank Thanks you. so much, Katrina. And Vlad, I think you're going to field a few questions, I think. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Katrina. Very uh, interesting research you've done there at Trinity. Uh, we have actually a couple of questions. Uh, first, a very practical one from, from our YouTube viewers. Which mind map software did you use? Uh, I think that was MindMump. MindMump. Um, MindMump, okay. Mind and then we had Mind. I have, you know, I've used a number of them, but as far as I remember, that was MindMump. Okay, thank you. And then we have a second question. What is the best instructional design model, model for e-learning? Well, I can't say I'm not biased. <laughs> so absolutely, and I'm sure Orna would concur, using the ABC learning design is absolutely super for us in terms of uh, matching activities to learning outcomes. But I also think from an instructional design perspective, we added on the design thinking and we looked at how the IDEO developed design thinking and which is all about empathizing with your users. And there's five stages in that design thinking to producing your material. And really, I think that that helped shape what it looked like, the look and feel of the material. And um, so I would highly recommend looking at design thinking. I, I agree because, but I'm also biased because uh, I, I love uh, the ABC model. So yeah, yeah, <laughs> I, yeah. I, I cannot say. Uh, but they work together. We we yeah. use both. They work together very well. And just, we took the design thinking after the ABC, after we had thought about our learning activities. It was more the design thinking then came into the presentation of it and the flow of it and and that kind of thing. Sure. And the content, of course. Of course. Um, until until we see if there are any other questions, I have a question for for all three of our speakers. And um, um, so my question for you is, where do you think synch synchronous uh, the asynchronous interactions are more most necessary or advantageous? So what in what part of of, of the process would you would you feel it's more it's, it's most needed of them? And you can you can jump in either either of you to answer this. I will talk a little bit about my background as being a Lebanese Canadian. Um, I have a lot of interaction from people in Lebanon, and the digital divide is so strong there. Then that when they move to the online learning. And relying only on the synchronous caused a lot of people to be at a disadvantage, especially with the power cuts and the internet cuts as well. So in, uh, in places where people do not have equal opportunities to technology or to the infrastructure uh, to have virtual learning happening synchronously, I think asynchronous uh, learning is very uh, has lots of benefits for those people. But these are not the only ones, but I'm just reflecting on my own background. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Of course, um, we, we are all aware of, of this situation and this makes total sense. Thank you, Rima. Sarah, would you have an input on this question? I, I, I do, um, but I think... I think it's a complex mix of variables that lead to whether the interaction is 
whether the design is going to be synchronous or asynchronous. So I, 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 I would like to have a, a sort of a pat answer, but I feel like I, I don't. Um, I agree though with Rima that you know the the equity issues that we're seeing that were a spotlight was shown on them during the pandemic, but they existed before even you know our the campus that I'm at right now. It's a it's a fully residential four-year undergraduate college. So the students live on campus most of the time. So when they are here and in person, you know, we we think um, we we may assume that internet access, for example, isn't an issue. And and while internet connectivity may be less of an issue, we also have certain assumptions about our students. Who's our imagined user? Who's the student for whom we design, right? And that we privilege our instructional designs for that student. And that is often a privileged student who has their laptop has their own devices. Um, and so, you know, I think that that a combination of, of asynchronous and synchronous potentially um, is th that including asynchronous activities is really important. And that's something that we've been trying to argue with with our faculty who um, may tend toward um, synchronous as as the default. So that's the position that, that we've that we've been coming from. And I think um, then your blend, right? That's a really interesting question. What's the blend? Um, and 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 I and I'll also say that that I, I've we've been able to lean into um, what Orna described as forty years of research, right, in online and distance learning around asynchronous learning to make the case for for asynchronous learning. I'm feeling less on less solid ground talking about the blend of synchronous and asynchronous because that is that feels um, newer. We have less, we have less of a research base. And now there's so much more that's of that that's happening because of the pandemic. So that's just, I'm just thinking out loud, but I, I that's an area that I, I would love to see, um, you know, further development in some of the great work that these panelists are doing is contributing to that, um, to, to, to think about what, what is that blend? What are the variables that we want to consider and 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 to respond um, to? But I do think asynchronous needs to be part of the mix. Thank you. Um, I I I think you are right that we need to find a balance between them. And the correct answer is it depends because um, uh, just try to to see what best fits you and your course and your learning personality and the learning personality of your students. So. Yep, yeah, I totally agree. Kaichona, uh, would you yeah, answer I, I, this? I, I, yeah, that, you know, that's exactly what I would say is that this mix has been a problem. You know, it's how much should I do asynchronous and how much should I do synchronous? And I think the asynchronous, the, the benefits is for equity have been highlighted a lot. But I also think if, you know, even, which I, you know, even looking at the research we're doing in Trinity, the synchronous, a lot of students like the synchronous live chance. And I think if you got rid of that, you're now talking about another unequal balance. So I think, and then I, I, I you know, and again, I think it's interesting around the STEM being more asynchronous than the other faculties. I think it can be discipline specific and I don't, you know, it's like anything, there's no one size fits all. Um, I, I think, though, when you're designing a course, you definitely need to take both into consideration. And, you know, it goes back to what we've discussed in a minute, go back to your design thinking and look at your learners and their needs and meet those. Um, and that should help you decide it. Thank you. Thank you for all your, all your answers. Um, I don't see any other questions in the chat or Q&A. So Orna, back to you. Thanks, Vlad. Uh, and actually, Sarah, Sarah had something in the chat, but it might have just come to the hosts and panelists, but it, 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 it's a nice way. But providing multiple modalities is a, way, is a way to address learner variability. And that's very much kind of in line with that universal design for learning, um, which, which, you know, which definitely is something to consider. Um, you know, if you're trying to make your learning more inclusive and accessible, because I think it's actually Accessibility Day today in Ireland. I'm not sure if that's a, an international day. So, so it's a nice way to end. So, so let me thank you to all our wonderful speakers for your talks. Really interesting. Uh, I really enjoyed the session. And thank you to all those who came along for coming. It's, it, it, you, you were great at participating. Uh, I really enjoyed some of the emoji and the the uh, nonverbal communication uh, that came through that Rima's talk prompted. Somebody somebody did a, a very interesting clap image 
we might have to take a picture of that. Um, and thank you again for coming to the this Eden Nap session. And if you'd like to uh, join Eden, you can get the details on the Eden website, which I'll put the link in the chat now in a second. So thank you very much. Have a good evening.